message in order, an ordinance entitled Amending City of Boston Code Ordinances Chapter 6, Section 6-6.3, six -six Schedule of Parking Fines. This matter was sponsored by Mayor Martin Walsh and referred to the Committee on Government Operations back on April the 11th, 2018. It seeks to update the fine schedule for specific categories of parking violations as well as create a new category of violation for overnight street sweeping in the City of Boston Municipal Code. The purpose of this ordinance is to improve safety, reduce congestion, ease resident parking burdens, help business districts, and increase cleanliness in the streets of Boston. I'd like to note that the hearing is being recorded and broadcast on Comcast Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Verizon 1964, and streamed on the Boston City Council TV online. Uh, joining us this morning uh, is um, uh, Chief of Streets, Chris Osgood uh, from the Department of Transportation and Sanitation. Uh, also, uh, our Commissioner, Commissioner Gina Fiendaka, along with um, Parking uh, Clerk Stephen McGuire, and also uh, Vinique Gutierrez here as well from Engineering, I would assume, right? Um, pl planning and planning and engineering. Planning and planning and engineering. Planning. From planning. Um, so, uh, welcome to everybody. And as my colleagues arrive, um, I'll introduce them in order as how they arrive. But uh, so, with that, um, We'll uh, turn it right over to, to the administration to um, give us, I guess, their, their uh, perspective on this ordinance and, I guess, the methodology behind um, uh, the uh, movement on the schedule of fines yep. and also maybe why some fines and not other fines. Uh, Absolutely. So that, because uh, we have a it's pretty pretty extensive list of schedule of fines, but we're only here to address certain ones. So just want to get a sense as to to uh, why those ones are not the others. So with that, uh, Chief, you have the floor. Perfect. Councilor, thank you so much. Thank you for uh, your leadership and collaboration throughout the entire budget process and beyond. Uh, the intent of this is really twofold. One, we wanted to resp respond to uh, constituent concerns that we've been hearing around parking across the city and parking issues across the city. And second, we want to accelerate the implementation of Go Boston 2030, uh, the mayor's long-term uh, mobility plan. Um, first, to touch on exactly what uh, you were focused on, why we're doing this, why we're doing, uh, why we're looking at this particular set of fines. Uh, over the last four years, we've seen a very significant change in the number of uh, constituent requests through 311, Councilor Sioma, uh, that uh, uh, that have been coming into us. Uh, in 2014, uh, we received 4,469 requests um, from constituents through 311 for parking enforcement issues. Uh, so four years ago, 4,469. Last year, that number had escalated up to 36,421. We've seen a massive increase in the number of constituents who are calling us, uh, asking for various uh, uh, parking enforcement uh, assistance uh, throughout our city um, and every single uh, day of the week. Uh, what we looked at when we looked at that significant escalation is that really sort of followed, fall, uh, fell into a set of buckets um, that we really wanted to address. There were a lot of concerns from residents uh, who were coming home at night and were finding people uh, without resident permit parking stickers who were parked in their neighborhood, wanted an easier way to be able to make sure that when they got home to their neighborhood in their car that there was a, uh, a space that would be available for them. And so we received a significant increase in the number of resident permit parking related uh, requests, which is why one of the uh, uh, requests here is to increase uh, the fine for uh, illegal parking in resident permit parking areas. The second sort of large category of constituent concerns that was raised to us was really in our business districts and around meters. Um, you have been a terrific uh, champion of uh, thinking about how we would expand support for small businesses by increasing opportunities for people to uh, find a meter, uh, to get in, run an errand, uh, have a bite to eat, shop, et cetera. Um, one of the ways in which we want to be able to increase that sort of turnover, increase small business support, is to adjust the fines associated with either not paying your parking limit, a parking meter, uh, overstaying the parking uh, uh, meter limit. And so there's a set of uh, three different fines in here, which is actually really the largest category of fines, uh, largest category of ticket issuance uh, that we're looking to increase, where we would increase three types of meter-related fines, essentially from $25 to $40. There's a third category uh, that we heard a tremendous amount of constituent feedback from, which is around uh, things that basically increase congestion on our streets uh, and, in, and decrease the safety, particularly for people who are driving, walking, or biking. Um, those are all things that are associated with uh, illegal parking in loading zones, uh, illegal parking in uh, no stopping, no standing zones, uh, parking in no parking areas, uh, and some double parking related, uh, related fines. Um, we looked at that category, and there are 
uh, six different fines in that category, the largest of which in terms of volume uh, is illegal parking in, uh, in loading zones. And we are adjusting those fines. I think we've all lived with the experience of seeing um, commercial deliveries, which are increasing in our city, um, happening in a travel lane rather than happening in a loading zone. And we want to figure out a way to actually get more uh, uh, commercial vehicles to the curb, so it's easier to do those commercial, uh, those important commercial trips, uh, quicker for the people who are restocking stores or restocking restaurants, uh, and not have them have to be in a travel lane. So we looked at uh, upgrading and adjusting a series of fines in those categories. Um, that includes, again, the uh, the loading zone uh, fine, the fine for no stopping and no standing. Uh, it also includes uh, adjusting the fines for no parking in what's called Zone A and Zone B, and double parking in Zone A and Zone B. Uh, zone A essentially is the sort of highest congested areas of the city of Boston. Uh, so if you think about uh, from the mass, from sort of the Mass Ave line more or less uh, towards downtown Boston, so it would be inclusive of things like the South End, Back Bay, Downtown, North End, West End, uh, Chinatown, uh, uh, Fenway, Kenmore. I think that's essentially the the full list. Uh, that is the, um, that's sort of the, the set that we were looking at. And in that group, again, kind of the largest set is really in terms of ticket issuance volume, our tickets are associated with, uh, with loading zone infractions, which is over 90,000 tickets in FY17, um, and does include uh, some things, as we've talked about in the past, around double parking in zone B, which again are kind of our more residential areas, uh, which it was only around 7,000 tickets uh, all of last year. It's important to note with all of these, with that category of tickets, um, our parking enforcement officers almost always lead with a conversation, not lead with a ticket. Um, they start by engaging the person who may be double parking if there is, if that person is there and, and encouraging them to move along. It is when there's nobody there that, they, that the ticket is often issued. Um, the fourth category that we looked at uh, is essentially adjustments to uh, an expansion of a program that we successfully piloted in Charlestown uh, two years ago. It's called the Ticket No Tow Program, uh, where uh, instead of towing vehicles uh, for street cleaning, we simply issued a higher uh, 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 a fine that wasn't $40. A, it was a, a ticket that was $90. Uh, that had a successful uh, sort of pilot run in Charlestown. We made it permanent in Charlestown. Uh, the proposal here is to actually expand that for overnight street sweeping in the city of Boston. Overnight street sweeping essentially is a street sweeping that the public works team does all year long uh, at night, so between uh, 12 a.m. and 7 a.m., uh, really on our main routes. Um, so think of all the largest uh, streets in the city of Boston. And the idea here is that instead of uh, towing vehicles, uh, which uh, typically will cost a constituent around $108, that we would actually end the tow and we would just focus on the ticket and consequently adjust the ticket from $40 to $90. That set of 11, Councillor, to your, your point, is sort of a subset of the more than 30 different ticket types that uh, the Transportation Department issues uh, and is really targeted on addressing uh, those things we've been hearing over and over again from constituents. How can I have better parking in my neighborhood? How can I have better parking in small business districts? Uh, how can I have less congestion uh, in my travels throughout the city? Uh, and how can I make sure that my street is, uh, is cleaner? Um, the uh, fine adjustments uh, that we are seeking uh, put us more in line with some of uh, sort of peer cities that have similar levels of, of density and congestion, places like Chicago, and San Francisco. Bless you, Anit. Um, and uh, essentially would be the most uh, sort of significant upgrade that we've had in our, our update we've had to our, uh, our ticket uh, uh, schedule since about 2008, which was the last time that was, this was sort of comprehensively done. It's important to note, and as we've talked about before, um, this is uh, likely not to be a revenue neutral uh, proposal, that there will be a revenue increase because of this, that we are expecting to be around $5 million. Um, the, uh, where that money would go uh, is things that the commissioner outlined in the BTD budget hearing uh, last week, uh, looking at upgrading the basics, so doing more street resurfacing, more sidewalk repair, investment in people to keep our, our signals uh, sort of updated and, and well-functioning throughout the city of Boston. It would also include uh, investing in things which we've heard uh, repeatedly from the city council, things that um, can really improve safety in our neighborhoods. So expansion of the number of neighborhood slow streets we would be able to do over the next four years, expansion of the number of, uh, amount of protected bike lanes we'd be able to do, expansion of the number of, uh, of challenging intersections we'd be able to address uh, in our engineering work. Our expectation is that through this, 
be able to expand our staff, not just to build, but also to maintain about 15 neighborhood slow streets, about 15 miles of protected bike lanes, and about 15 uh, challenging intersections uh, that, but for this investment, we wouldn't be able to do. The third piece where this money would, uh, would go would be into creating uh, what we're calling a transit team. This would be a team that could work with the MBTA uh, to better coordinate work between the city of Boston and what the MBTA is doing. Uh, so whether that is uh, work around sort of traffic signals on Green Line corridors, um, coordination around long-term investment, uh, or work around some of the bus initiatives that we've got going on, that's what the transit team would focus on. The fourth area that uh, this money would be able to go to is really changing the way in which we work with uh, private stakeholders who are also in the transportation space. So we'd be able to hire somebody who could uh, work with groups like uh, like Masco, uh, like the Seaport TMA, and other TMAs across uh, the city of Boston who are basically providing private transportation services and making sure that we are coordinating and supporting those so that those are also able to get uh, people to and from work every single day in a very convenient, uh, reliable fashion. Um, additionally, uh, we know that there's a lot of disruption that is happening uh, in our in transportation from uh, right now from shared trips uh, from things like Uber and Lyft as well as things like autonomous vehicles in the future and electric vehicles and more in the near term. We'd be able to hire somebody who can help us better coordinate um, our streets and uh, make sure that as TNCs and EVs and uh, autonomous vehicles evolve that they're that they're doing so in a regulated fashion that works well for uh, the objectives of our constituents. So in total, uh, this, uh, what this package is, uh, is really a response to is these, these two different items. One is the fact that we've heard a tremendous amount from our collective constituents um, that there's a need for uh, greater management of parking throughout the city of Boston. We see that again in that escalation of through on one calls. We're trying not to, uh, we're trying to sort of focus our adjustments on those things that residents have told us they are most interested in. Uh, so again, improving resident parking experience, improving the business parking experience, uh, uh, making sure that we are reducing congestion on our streets to the extent possible and improving the cleanliness of our streets. And by doing that, we're then able to invest in a whole set of transportation investments that we have collectively uh, imagined and planned for through the Go Boston 2030 process. Um, so that is sort of a, a high level of the overview. Um, we are happy to dive into any of the specifics uh, that, and answer any questions that you may have. Uh, very good. We've uh, been joined by my colleague, City Councilor Mark Siomo and City Councilor Matt O'Malley, and also just have a, a brief letter to read from our colleague, uh, City Councilor Josh, Josh Sakem, uh, dear Chairman Flaherty, due to a longstanding commitment, I'm unable to attend today's hearing, docket 0566 regarding parking fines, traffic pedestrian, safety parking, and other transit improvements are um, some of the most important issues to my constituents in District 8 and to the residents across the city. I'm glad the Mayor has put this matter before us so we can review all of our current policies in this area. I regret that I'm able to participate in person, but I look forward to reviewing the video of the hearing and as well as any other written testimony that is submitted. Sincerely, Josh Zakem. So, um, throw it out to my colleagues. Any, any initial questions from Councilor Siomo or Councilor O'Malley? I, I probably should have asked in advance, so I apologize. Uh, I, I was just wondering uh, the, the collection rate in general, and A, do you look at them, uh, do you break it down by mass plates and out of state plates? Just curious. Uh, actually, it's not broken down by in-state or out-of-state, but the collection rate is about 92% oh, on that's parking good. violations. That's pretty good. Yeah. That 8% of those out-of-state <laughs> plates, I'm telling yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> and on that note, uh, could we have a neighborhood-by-neighborhood neighborhood breakdown of on all the schedule of fines? Right. Obviously, we're trying to strike the balance is between, uh, you know, obviously is the there a way to public safety piece, but also to make sure we're balancing yeah, the neighborhood so that no one neighborhood is sort of being right. overly burdened or punished with a specific category of fines versus another. Uh, we can, get, I don't have that information with me, but I can certainly get that for you. Yeah, like in, so a neighborhood by neighborhood breakdown by for category over the last, say, you know, three years would probably be a fair represent, representation. Council Sumo. Yeah, I just want, is there a way to, to break it down by how many are issued to out of state folks? And we could certainly get that information as well. Yeah, they I'd do have curious. a database I mean, we, of in state, yeah. out of state vehicles I mean, we, that are Most of our, my complaints, especially in my neighborhood, there's a ton of out of state plates. And I know it's really difficult to, you know, students basically have the ability, I guess, to not, e not uh, be required to register their car if they're attending you know, an undergraduate course, I believe. 
Um, yeah, so to that point, so, can, uh, so for, the, and for the edification of those maybe watching at home, what is the rule? So because we get calls to my office, you'll have someone out front of their home with a Michigan license plate, and they call the office repeatedly saying, it's been out front of my house for three months, you know, aren't they supposed to switch over? What are the rules, and how do we enforce it? Uh, Council, they, they are supposed to switch over if they're residents here for more than 30 days. Um, students are exempt from that as well as active military personnel. Um, the challenge with enforcing that is that it has to be observed for 30 consecutive days, and it's almost as if a, a ticket has to be issued 30 consecutive days before you can advance this through um, the Registry of Motor Vehicles and state agencies to require the registration here in state. Uh, but we can certainly get you the breakdown of parking tickets in state and out of state as well as um, a rough co collection rates for So, for so short vehicles. of a constituent standing in front of the vehicle, taking a photo with, say, the morning newspaper for 30 consecutive days, <laughs> we can't do anything about it. So it, it, it. It is quite challenging to enforce right. that. So how do we use this opportunity? The doors open here with these schedule of fines. How do we, how do we revisit that one? We, we are quite diligent with regard to enforcing resident permit regulations, and um, out-of-state vehicles are, are not allowed to participate in the program um, un unless they're active military. And one of the sort of the, the um, spur for a resident parking program is when there's an influx of um, people that don't live in the neighborhood coming to park there. That does include, um, in some cases, students or vehicles that are not registered in state, uh, registered outside of the neighborhood. And that's where a resident parking program can be quite helpful. So the person would have to call 311 every day for 30 straight days, potentially, right? And I know this happens across the city, so I guess does that account for a portion of the increase in the phone calls in terms of those types of violations require literally a 30-day um, repeated effort? Also coupled with in how you dissect this from 311, I talked to some of the 311 employees in terms of the, sometimes there's an organized effort, there may be a campaign, or there'll be a specific building, or from a community group, they'll say, hey, you gotta call, you gotta call, you gotta call, and so you'll, they just, the, the 311 will just be flooded with calls on one specific issue, and then we react to it. Um, I don't know what, what percentage of that happens, but uh, I, I talked to some of the 311 operators, and they, they get a sense that it's, so the same person, the same people, just calling repeatedly, kind of the squeaky wheel theory, I guess, would be a fair assumption here. But mm -hmm. uh, so I guess you had mentioned in your answer there has been an increase of calls. Yes. What percentage is that? Is the poor people that have to call 30 straight days in a row, and what percentage of it is the sort of the organized efforts, um, you know, by a, a building or a community group or an organization to try to affect change uh, to, to to satisfy their their agenda. <laughs> I'm not sure we would have that for other than sort of anecdotally, but I, I'm sure we can figure out, we can uh, sort of dimensionalize that in some way. Right. Uh, sort of Brad Garrett and Tom uh, yeah. McKay, who uh, sort of live those calls every single day, right. and, and their, their teams would sort of have a good sense of that. So. Yeah, some folks have mastered the phone tree, which, you know, it's, it's fair game because we have a 311 system, and we are in a day and age of sort of, um, you know, dashboard and digital stuff, and mm -hmm. sometimes the person on one of the phone calls <laughs> one side of the perspective, and then if you actually get out there in the neighborhood of the street, you see a different perspective. But so I just want to make sure that we're we're conscious of um, of sort of the organized effort, the campaign, yep. the phone tree. Yep. That when we're reacting, we're doing it because it's in the interest of public safety. We're doing it because it mm -hmm. makes sense. We're not just we got to stop these three one one calls. That one building calls fifty times a day, you know, every day for the whole year. We just got to we got to move the spot, or we got to change this, or bump that out. Or mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that that's not how we're operating. One of the, to that point, I mean, one of the, I think there's a, a need to sort of solve the underlying problem to, to exactly that point. It's, it's uh, and one of the things which is in this proposal that we've certainly heard from uh, this body in the past is that there is there has traditionally been a gap in sort of the period of enforcement that parking enforcement officers have been available. We do get a high number of calls sort of during hours when uh, there are perhaps fewer parking enforcement officers mm -hmm. on. This would allow us to hire an additional parking enforcement supervisor so we could look at what the shift structure might, be lo might look like so we can respond to some of your previous requests around the, the optimal shift structure for uh, parking enforcement, which, to your point, Councillor, helps us get to the underlying. If there's an underlying problem that we need to solve, mm -hmm. we should solve that rather than right. hear every single day 50 different right. calls. And so, and why are we not having a conversation about maybe potentially expanding the hours? So my, my, my issue, and I'm gonna have, mm -hmm. a, I have severe reservations about on the, on the metered parking side. Until we address the handicapped parking, fraud, and abuse, as the chair, I can't move 
the parking meter one forward, um, it just wouldn't be fair. Furthermore, it would just exacerbate the abuse because if people realize that the fines are gonna go up, that's just gonna encourage more people to go to their doctor to get the note to get the free pass, So, which would then in turn cause us to lose additional revenue. So serious reservations on the schedule that, res that speaks to parking meters until that gets addressed, and that's just a matter of basic fairness. Um, it's everyone pay playing by the rules, being punished, and once we increase the fines, it's gonna increase circling the block, it's gonna increase the handicap parking fraud and abuse, it's gonna decrease our parking meter revenue. So on that note, you guys come here to the council for the fine schedule, but you don't come here for increasing the meter fee. So, so I, I gotta understand that a little better. And then further, while we're here, why aren't we talking about moving the meters beyond eight o'clock? Uh, my former colleague, our former colleague, City Council Salamantino, I think had raised that issue uh, we see it happening across the country uh, where, um, you know, meters are available till 10, 10. maybe 11 o'clock at mm -hmm. night. So I guess I don't know what thought has gone into whether or not. So right now we're 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Should we be 7 a.m. to, you know, 11 p.m.? I don't know. And if so, would, would that generate for additional revenue? But again, the door is open here. We can address the handicap parking fraud and abuse once and for all. Serious reservations as the chair to move anything around handicap um, around parking meters until that's addressed, and then while we're here, aren't we? Why don't we talk about it, uh, meter hours. the meter fees? Mm -hmm. Why doesn't the council have input on the meter fees, like we do on the schedule of fines? And then why aren't we moving the hours to adjust to the changing city? So I know that's a lot in sort no, of one area, so but take the it's all about maybe I'll talk parking about the, meters. You want to talk about the first, and I'll talk about the other. To your uh, point on the handicap plaque is I do sit on a uh, handicap plaque abuse task force that's run through the state um, as Department of Transportation through the, uh, the registrar's office and they've passed legislation to make it more difficult for doctors to just sign off on on placards and hand them out uh, like everyone gets a placard type of thing so they are cracking down on the, the doctors that are issuing these placards. So, but the crux of the issue is why, why aren't they required to pay the meter like everybody else? That's a legislative uh, Right, because we have the, we have the iPads, we I have the- I believe legislation was filed to, um, to have that mm -hmm. actually happen to make handicapped placard people pay the meters, right. but I'm not which sure would then, how yeah, far Which would then, which would then eliminate probably 80, maybe 90% of right. the fraud and abuse. Can the city do a pilot program? So we do pilot programs around yep. surge pricing, around special events for meters. Why couldn't we sort of adopt a, uh, a zone or a pilot program whereby we're saying, you know, in this area, if you have a handicapped placard, you have to pay the meter like everybody else. It's gonna reduce the circling mm -hmm. of the block, it's gonna reduce the fraud and the abuse, and it's gonna, <coughs> I guess, have a level and fair playing field for those that need so to take advantage of meter spaces. Um, if legislation were to pass, we could certainly implement that. Um, currently, we're not allowed to charge at parking meters for vehicles with a handicap plate or, or a placard or disabled veterans. Uh, we have worked hard with the Registrar of Motor Vehicles as well as with the Inspector General. Um, Commissioner McCosh also sits on that commission. Um, and they've done some good work around reforms, both with regard to the placard um, distribution and how they, the program is administered through the RMV as well as with placard design so that um, they are required to be renewed on a more regular basis. Uh, we are able to verify the um, validity of a placard if a parking ticket is issued and the recipient disputes that. So we have good communication and coordination with the RMV um, and we do feel like they're moving ahead on, on reforms and we're supportive of their efforts. Okay. And then is expanding the hours of, of, uh, of meters, is there an appetite? Yes, I mean, I think we, and, as, as you and have. what would that require? Again, we're here before the schedule yep. of fines. Is that yep. just, a, you know, could we just add some language here and, and off and running? What's the, right. yes. yeah. and then from it, an enforcement it, standpoint, do we have the capacity to, 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 uh, to enforce till 11 o'clock at night or is that overtime? Is that extra shifts, is it? Uh, to increase the meter hours of operation beyond 8 p.m., um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. around some business districts mm -hmm. um, that would be within the, the shift structure, so enforcement would be able to support that. Okay. As it currently stands? Correct. So that yes. would be in an ordinance form, or would that just be in a policy form? Um, that, that would be policy, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. So maybe we give some thought to 
making some if, of those adjustments. If there are particular corridors where you think that would make, make sense, we, we certainly hear in some areas where uh, there are meters that are kind of on the, the edge between a residential area and a business area that there's a, a preference for an earlier termination of the meter hour so that they essentially convert to resident parking right. after, a, after a certain period of time. Right. Uh, but if there are places, to your point, where there's a high number of restaurants uh, or things yeah. where there's turnover later uh, later at night, then yeah. I would mm -hmm. consider look at extending the Well, hours. you see that there's the mad dash to sort of get the spot at like 6.02. Exactly, because right? then it's free yeah. for, yeah. It for the Correct. night. Yes. So you see, particularly in and around a lot of the restaurants, you see the mad dash from the wait staff mm -hmm. and the dish washers, anyone else just running out in a panic with a fistful of quarters just to mm -hmm. get to the 8 o'clock hour, I guess. Um, so we want to make sure, we're, I guess, we're not hurting those workers that need somewhere to park to earn a living. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it creates some congestion and confusion. And then on the Uber and the Lyft side of the house, I mean, that's, yeah. that's, that's a big chunk of this stuff. Yeah. Um, they're getting a free pass. And you know, we had Boston Police in before us the other day with the Hackney Division. So the Hackney Division is, you know, quickly decreasing, if you will, uh, not so much the division, but the need okay. for it. Uh, but Uber and Lyft, every car, every other car, car to your left, car to your right, car in front of you, car behind you, everyone picking up, dropping off in the middle of the street, mm -hmm. on the side, they're just, it's right. lawlessness. But what, if anything, can we do from your perspective on, uh, on kind of reeling that in a little bit? So there's about 96,000 trips for the last year. There were about 96,000 Uber Lyft trips that started in the city of Boston every day. So to your point, there's a very high, there's a very high volume. Um, just under 35 million in total all, in all of 2017. So one of the things that, that the transportation department is, is doing is to getting at exactly the issue that you raised. How do we actually get uh, those vehicles to the curb so that the actual pick up and drop off can actually be safer, that they are not stopping in a travel lane causing congestion and safety issues across our city. Um, so I don't know if you guys want to talk about the, the pilot that we have coming up, but that is the piece that's sort of within our control that we can do in the near term, and then there's some longer term efforts as well. Sure, so um, a couple of things around Uber and Lyft and, and TNC operations. One is that um, increasing the fine for double parking um, should help address that, um, as well as some of the reinvestments in the transportation department with um, a dedicated staff to work with TNCs and to identify how best to address those issues. Um, along with that is a position in this budget as part of the reinvestment to uh, better manage TAPAs, a transportation access plan agreements with larger developers. Um, our objective is really to encourage them to provide um, a space within their own property for both loading as well as TNC pick up and drop off. Um, when, when the Boston Marathon was taking place here, um, Uber was the sponsor of the marathon, so we worked with the BAA as well as Uber to identify some rendezvous points that were um, sort of conveniently located but outside of the, the core race um, course, and that seemed to work very well. So those are all models, but some of the work that is already taking place in um, the planning division under Vineet Gupta will be able to continue on an accelerated pace to identify how best to manage uh, this disruptive transportation mode. Okay. But uh, just on that, uh, Commissioner, that, that would require a meeting me to literally have to be like, aha, I got you. Like, so an Uber pulls over. So I think f from on the double parking side of the house, that's going to be, it's going to be very rare. It's going to be very confrontational. You're going to have someone pulling away and have a meeting me trying to follow them to slap the sticker on the windshield. I, I would argue someone's going to get hurt. That would have probably have to be enforcement from, from our police department. So if we have an Uber and Lyft unloading literally in the middle of the street or sort of pulled over off to the side, and people are bailing out of the car, and then we have one of your enforcement officers like running up to the car. I just I envision that going from <clears throat> bad to worse in a in a nail. Well, we certainly always encourage our officers, um, particularly when a vehicle is stopped in a travel lane. Sometimes the driver is in the vehicle with yeah. hazard lights on. Um, they're creating a safety hazard yeah. for other motorists as well as cyclists, yeah. and we. we uh, want them to find a curbside spot. So our objective would be to provide these rendezvous points so that uh, working with Uber and Lyft, we can geocode some areas within uh, popular destination points where they would have access to a curbside location where they could meet their customer as well as safely um, allow the customer to disembark. Any questions of my colleague, Madam Allen? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, when's the I apologize, it was a little bit late, so you may have already gone over this, but briefly. When's the last time we increased uh, fines? 
for these? In a large scale way, 2008. 2008, so 10 years. Um, is that par for the course every 10 years or so? These are, are evaluated? Or I guess it's not an exact science. No. Okay. Uh, it's not really an exact science. Uh, it, I think prior to that, uh, it, w it was um, less than 10 years. OK. And where do we compare to other cities, um, roughly, in terms of our schedule of fines and fees for parking-related offense? Uh, so we, we looked at things like uh, LA, New York, Chicago, San Francisco. Uh, it's a, there's a little bit of a variation, but for example, uh, if you were to look at uh, meters, meter expired, uh, right now in Boston it's 25. What we're proposing is it goes from 25 to 40. Uh, in the New York City Central Business District, uh, that's actually at 65. For the rest of New York, it's uh, $35. In Chicago, it's either $50 or $65. In San Francisco, it's either $73 or $84. So okay. it is closer to, though still less than, what some of our other sort of peer cities would be. Okay, okay. And do you, you know, uh, thank you. Do you know how much revenue this would yield? So our, our estimate right now is that it would yield about $5 million. $5 million? Yeah. Okay. And will that be sort of, I, I don't want to use the word airmark, but directed towards, I know that I appreciate the mayor's efforts and your efforts to put that into better cycling infrastructure, yep. either multiple mold, is that the same Correct. plan with this? Great. Exactly. And um, are we expanding the, I believe the answer is yes, but the, um, the uh, the Charlestown pilot program in terms of no yes. towing on street clean, that's going to be citywide. It would, but just for overnight. So just for our overnight uh, street, uh, cleaning. street cleaning. So it would not be the daytime street, street cleaning program. So really just our main corridors overnight. Would, why not do just all street cleaning? So the thought was that the overnight program is where, from the public works perspective, they felt that it would both have the behavior change and we'd still be able to address any places where a car wasn't moved. That for us to go from one neighborhood to the entire city so quickly might actually leave us with some places in the city we're not going to be able to get to the curb and get, get our streets to be as clean as our residents want. So this okay. is sort of the next logical step that we felt would, we could okay. actually handle. But we'd be open to maybe reevaluating it if this yeah. proves to be if a it, success. If it's successful, okay. absolutely. And then to that point, um, and we've talked, Chief, on mm -hmm. this before, and this may not be the pertinent issue for this, but um, I think that we need to demand more of our uh, of our vendors uh, with whom we work in terms of towing. Um, there are different rules for different tow companies. Yeah. The mere fact that one of the largest ones, which is in my district, yeah. and I've had to pick up my car there, uh, refuses to take cash when it says specific, I mean, refuses yes. to take, take a payment yes. other than cash. Yes. I understand checks, I understand yeah. credit cards. Debit cards are the same as cash. Um, they, of course, have an ATM on site, yeah. and there have been issues in terms yeah. of people whose yeah. information has been compromised. So something like that, I think, is unconscionable, and we should make that a requirement of any contract. vendor that wants to get a contract be able to have a certain, you know, con consumer uh, protections there. Uh, so, but, but that's, Agreed. Yep. We'll just follow up on that later. And then um, do, does every parking meter, uh, is every parking meter equipped with the parking, Park Boston app? Yes. And do you have any idea of how, yet, yet they still take quarters? Uh, yes. Yes. Correct. Quarters, yes. cards, and app. Yeah. Um, do you have a breakdown on what percentage of, do you know it? Yeah. Uh, 50? Kamish? I just remember. Uh, the, I can say that the vast majority of payments are um, electronic at this point, whether it's through the app or through credit cards. Yeah. Um, most, I don't have the specific percentages off the top of my head, but I can certainly get those I, I, to you. It's really more of a curiosity. Yeah. I, th I think it's such a, a um, it's such a consumer, um, easy consumer fix mm -hmm. that we're doing, so I understand it. And I, I'm just curious, as the sort of increase in technology grows and people feel mm -hmm. more comfortable in understanding with it, I'd, I'd love to see the trend on that. Mm -hmm. And then finally, are, is there any other um, movement to uh, uh, establish more electric uh, charging, electric car charging station uh, meters? So we've had a number of, of conversations about that and a lot of what BTD does and Vinny's team negotiates is thinking about off-street locations within private developments, which mm -hmm. Vinny can talk about. We're also thinking about how to have more public access to EV charging uh, and the right strategy for that. Well, we, we have we thought of putting any Vineet at um, municipal lots? Yeah. <clears throat> yes, we have, and that's something that uh, we're working with our municipal uh, lot uh, manager, uh, Danny Nuzo. Uh, mm -hmm. It's something we're definitely exploring. I, I think it's a great idea. How many lots do we have? How many, uh, uh, EV? How many municipal lots? How many municipal uh, lots do we have? Thir 32 municipal parking lots in the city. 
Uh, What's the biggest one? Uh, Jamaica Plain? JP? I like it. I believe it's Jamaica Plain. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Yeah. I think there'd be uh, a healthy yeah. appetite for EV charging stations there. And is there, mm -hmm. but if I don't have an EV and I park at an EV meter, that's not illegal, right? I know it's frowned upon, but that can't be, a, we can't restrict by type of car. Um, there, there are some parking meters that are located um, near City Hall yeah. down on, on Cambridge Street. Those are only available for EV vehicles. So, you, so if you don't have an EV and you park in one of those, you could get a ticket? That is correct. Have we issued any tickets for that? Um, we have issued tickets, and, and it's actually a towable offense. So, wow. Um, but generally, those, those meters are occupied by vehicles that are actively charging. Yeah, I, I, I have an EV, and I've used it, but I, I just assumed yeah. it was sort of, because I have seen, I've seen e electric cars that haven't been charging there, which seems counterintuitive, because you pay for the meter, and the, for the charging and is the, free. The, the curb is also um, yeah. green. I, just, I didn't know we could do that. Okay, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you, Mr. Good. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Councilor O'Malley. Uh, any any yeah. questions? Mark, Councilor Siomo. Um, the, um, hand, the handheld devices, what kind of capabilities do they have? So if you, you know, hit a, a, a plate, does any of their history of violations come up? Can, can you, is that a uh, plus? Currently, they do not. They do not. Uh, do they have that capability? You would think that it, uh, they, they, yeah, they could expand to that uh, capability. I'm just wondering, like, A, people who don't pay their, their tickets have back tickets? People the, who are chronic, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, chronic yeah. offenders, you know? The, there are a number of capabilities in the handheld devices, and one is to preload um, files in them. Uh, one of them is the resident permit parking files, so that when a vehicle is parked in a resident permit area, um, before a ticket is issued for that violation, the plate would, um, the right. officer would be alerted that there is a valid permit for whatever neighborhood they happen to have it for, mm -hmm. as well as the boot file. So if a vehicle is ticketed that is um, seizure eligible, um, that information would also be displayed alerting the enforcement mm -hmm. officer who would then notify a supervisor of the location so that a boot crew can be dispatched. Okay. And it's a stolen vehicle file as well. Right. right. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking there may be a way to really um, kind of identify chronic offenders, mm -hmm. right? right, that either A, don't pay their fines at all or just keep doing the same thing over and over again. Um, and, and I think this was asked, so I apologize, but uh, this, all this revenue would go into the parking meter fund and then be appropriated from there? So to be clear, it, it actually goes into the general fund, but oh, the, there's, uh, as was raised before, that essentially uh, this would implicitly fund the transportation enhancements that are also part of the transportation right. department's budget. Okay. And uh, so, I, I support these increases. Um, I, to Councilor Flaherty's point, I support the increase, especially in the street cleaning fine. One hundred and eight dollars go to the tow company right now. Forty goes to us. Um, I think, and we've said this many times, the increase from forty to ninety and no tow maybe would help you know, a hokey hanging on to the side, blowing the dirt out from the parked car. And I, again, I think the goal is to clean our streets, and I, I understand that, but we're not, we're, not get, we're not benefiting financially from those scoff laws, and maybe we should analyze the kind of revenue we're getting. Would it be offset by having someone do that? I'd be even for raising it more. And then lastly, my only nitpicky thing here is the parking too far from the curb going from 45 to 75. Um, I think that, and again, this is speculation, but I would think that it's probably inexperienced parkers and elderly parkers that are, are the, um, the main violators of that, probably because the newer drivers don't have it down yet, parallel parking, and elderly might need a little extra room to a passenger to get out or whatever. Just wondering if um, we should look at that a little. 
we can take a look at that. I think that it is, mm -hmm. I, and correct me if I'm that may be the way in which we are defining double parking as opposed to, uh, it, it's not it not intended as a, you've oh. parked uh, a couple of feet. It's more of a, a significant okay. distance from the curb. Because, well, I'm, so. just to, so I have section two is parking too far from the curb, section three is double okay. parking. Okay. I'm sorry. It, it, yeah, double parking. I think it's double parking. But I, we will double, let's clarify that and we'll, we'll get back to you on that. Okay, right. I just think, you know, if you, you know, I don't like it either <laughs> when people are sticking out, right? Yep. However, if it's, a, I think it's a foot is mm -hmm. the max. If it's a foot and two inches, you know, and it's an elderly person or a young kid or whatever, just a. We'll, we'll, we'll clarify that, Councilor. Exactly. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. We've also been joined by my colleague, uh, City Councilor Anissa Rasabi George. Any questions at this time? I have uh, just a very quick Thank you, um, and thank you, good morning, thank you for all being here. Um, I have a quick question. This morning I happened to see two vehicles being towed, four vehicles being towed for street cleaning, and, I, and I'm curious about the time sometimes wasted while we wait for all of those cars to get moved, but then also of those four cars that were towed, two of them had out-of-state license plates. And I, I know in all of our neighborhoods, we have so many residents that have not re-registered um, permanent residency here, haven't re-registered their cars, so they are not paying state insurance rates, excise taxes, all that sort of stuff. So I wonder if, if there is any measurement around the, the time that's wasted when we tow, um, but then also the loss of that tax revenue on the excise tax piece for cars that are registered outside the city so and outside the, the Commonwealth, really. On, on the first one, you're absolutely right. There is, a, there, it does slow up the street cleaning process uh, as we wait for tow. So one of the hopes with this is it actually will make our overall street cleaning program actually much more efficient because we're not waiting for that tow overnight. Um, we have done some analysis, but I don't think we actually have quantified necessarily the exact sort of time savings that this would get, but oh, well, we can take a look into that. In terms of the plate analysis around towing, you guys may know that. As far as registered vehicles, a uh, person does have 30 days to register a vehicle in the city of Boston, and, and uh, we're finding it a little difficult to enforce that since we have to ticket them consecutively 30 days to, in order to, to know that they've been there and have not registered mm -hmm. their car. But any out-of-state vehicle is not eligible to get a resident sticker for any neighborhood for the neighborhood they may be parking in or any other. You do have to have it registered and insured in that neighborhood in order to get a resident parking sticker. And they need to be tagged for 30 consecutive days in uh, order to be? To, to, to clarify, Councillor, they need to be observed for 30 days before the information can be brought to the registered motor vehicles or the insurance commission, because that's actually where the violation um, would 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 be would be enforced. It's technically not a parking violation um, simply to have an out-of-state vehicle on a city street unless it's in a resident permit area. Uh, raising the fine for resident parking would certainly uh, allow us to better manage that program, but um, it's actually not a blanket parking violation that we can enforce. Is there ever an opportunity to um make a higher fine for an out-of-state plate? Um, My biggest I'm frustration is after a snowstorm and there's a mm -hmm. car that's defrosted over a couple of weeks and as that snow melts away you realize it's, a, it's someone from Connecticut or Rhode Island or somewhere else and knowing that they're not contributing at all um, to excise taxes in particular. But that, that's it for me. Thank you. We could certainly look into that, Councilor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, just uh, re responding to Councilor Siomo's question, so CBC 6-6.3, if we go to T, it says the fine for parking a vehicle in excess of 12 inches from the edge of a curb or roadway shall be $35. A penalty of $11 shall be assessed if the fine remains unpaid 21 days after the issuance. So is that one that's in this list of to be... Um, revisit um, or I don't or believe so. No, our no. intent was not to no. adjust that one. It was just a, right. it was just a double part. Right, so that's, so. that's under 6-6.3T right. is the one that Council Siomo is yeah. referring to. So that's not in this no. Correct. suggested um, request right. for the request for an increase. Okay, very good. Um, and the Chair recognizes Councilor O'Malley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Quick question follow-up on Councilor Sabi-George. 
I'm, perhaps I'm missing this, but as it relates to the out-of-state folks, which is an issue that we all deal with, and I know you folks deal with it, and I understand, I think, what you're saying, that we'd have, you'd have to observe it every day for 30 days to show a pattern, but why, why couldn't we observe it once, say, a month or two or three months later, observe it again, and then at least send a letter or something now, I think the point would be it could be just someone who lives out of state, we happen to catch them twice in the same day, but let them sort of explain that. We can certainly get clarification around that policy. Um, it's technically, it, it's not within the purview of a parking enforcement officer to um, observe that and then be able to issue any type of violation to the owner of the vehicle. Um, it really sits with the insurance commission and the, the and state I agencies. I mean, do they cross-reference sort of um, homeowners that use the residential exemption and have out-of-state plates? Do you uh, know? I might be going. In, in terms of, of what the the students or active military? No, I guess students are le less my concern. There's a, there's a significant number of you know, younger professionals, even older professionals who I know live full time in our neighborhoods and register their cars either out of state or certainly out of city because it's a lot less expensive and it then creates a system that those of us who play by the rules are paying much higher insurance premiums and I just, I don't know how we, how we can address that. It's, it's, it's as old as, you know, the, when Henry Ford's Model T first came off the, uh, the assembly line, I'm sure someone had this great idea, but is there any way that we, could be a little more aggressive in cracking down on that. We can certainly do some research around yeah. what the options would be. Okay. Yeah. No, yeah, we just, we just remain it. a big complaint mm -hmm. that all colleagues get uh, from that. So, mm -hmm. very good. Uh, so, I just want to run through the list of 12 yep. just so that uh, we're on the same page. And then uh, Stephen indicated he's going to get me a neighborhood by neighborhood breakdown of, um, mm -hmm. of yeah. violations from that. Just to, and then you. Um, uh, Heard my concerns around the um, the uh, parking meter situation. Yes. Um, so section one <clears throat> says the current fee is seventy five dollars. You are proposing moving that to ninety dollars. That's parking a vehicle in violation of any posted prohibition against stopping or standing of motor vehicles. The second one is um, uh, double parking within zone A. Currently is forty five dollars. You guys are proposing seventy five dollars. It's my understanding that zone A is basically from the waterfront, and that's, I guess, through East Boston, Charlestown, North End, around the South Boston waterfront, all the way out to Mass Ave is technically zone A. Um, and anything from Mass Ave further out is zone B. Is that my reading? Uh, ge generally, the downtown core um, is zone A. East Boston would be zone B. East well, zone B. East, yeah. East Boston right, is even zone though B. it's Boston, it says it's in the, in we broke it down and it was talking about the waterfront. Yeah. So it mentions yes. Boston's waterfront. So I always North End I would, would be zone A. On the waterfront. Good. So so North End, the downtown along the water, the South Boston waterfront, all the way out to Mass Ave is zone A. Everything else is zone B, including East Boston. Okay. Yes. Uh, double parking uh, within zone A goes from 45 to 75 under your proposal. Double parking within zone B goes from 30 to 55. Um, and uh, does that include? Um, See zone B. So if we're in the South Boston waterfront, are we also South Boston, the South Boston neighborhood? That would be zone A or zone B. The South Boston would be zone B. Okay. So we're going to go from like so, I guess it's probably shaped like kind of like the gavel. So the waterfront area here, and then it's going to go right through to the financial and business <coughs> district. It's zone A, and then everything else around it is well, zone would be zone, zone B. B. Okay. Um, parking within residential parking districts with no resident parking sticker. Currently it's now 40. You guys are proposing 60. Parking a vehicle in violation of the prohibition against parking in a loading zone. It's currently 55. You guys are proposing 90. Parking a vehicle in violation of the prohibition against parking a motor vehicle within zone A. Currently it's 55. You guys are proposing 90. Steve, can you explain what that is? Parking a vehicle in violation of prohibition against parking motor vehicles within zone A. That's no parking, parking zones. Zone. Yeah, that's the, the downtown core, as we mentioned, the zone A. But what would it be? So I would drive my car and I would, how would I get one of those tickets? It would be a posted no parking zone. Gotcha. So no parking. Correct. I park right. my car. Next one would be parking a vehicle in violation of prohibition against parking a motor vehicle within zone A. It's currently 55. You're proposing 90. 
uh, parking a vehicle in a metered space when the parking meter zone is effective, failing to pay the amount in time. Currently it's 25, proposed fee is 40. Uh, you hear my argument on that one. Uh, parking a vehicle other than a commercial one in a metered space over the time limit in a particular zone, current fee is 25, proposed fee is 40. You obviously heard, heard my concerns about that. Parking a vehicle in violation of prohibition against parking of motor vehicles within zone B, currently 25, you're proposing 55. Parking over the posted limit within zone B, currently is 25, you're proposing 40. And then as referenced earlier, I think it was Council Siomo in or Councilor O'Malley talking about the street cleaning, which is uh, concerns parking a vehicle and designated for street cleaning within one or more pilot zones. How many pilot zones do we currently have other than Charlestown? Uh, Charlestown is the only pilot zone that that's we have considered at this one time. zone. Yes. Okay. Uh, currently, that fee is ninety um, dollars, and I guess the proposed fee is ninety for specific times of twelve oh one a.m. to seven a.m. Correct. So that, there's no there's no increase. We're going to we're expanding the hours, but we're not expanding the fee. Is that my understanding? Uh, hours the, and geography. The, this pertains to the overnight street cleaning yeah. program, where right now the ticket is forty dollars, but it's towable. So this would. Um, allow us to eliminate the towing for that um, with the increased fine, which would be identical to the program in Charlestown. Okay. Um, all right. And then with respect to crosswalks and hydrants and um, handicap ramps, and those are not included in any, any of these ones, so? Correct. That's not part of this. Gotcha. And is there any appetite? Um, if there's any offset needed uh, with respect to, to on the parking meter side um, to go grab another one? I, I, we're certainly happy to that feedback. We were basically trying to build off of where we were hearing the most complaints, okay. but we were happy to gotcha. adjust. All right. All right, so as long as, Steve, if I can just get that schedule across the city in terms of the last three years of where they're coming from. And Absolutely. want to yeah. make sure we're being fair, we're reasonable, we're balanced, we're, you know, mm -hmm. clearly public safety is of paramount importance, but want to make sure that, you know, sort of no one neighborhood or no one zone uh, of yeah. the city mm -hmm. um, is, is being that. And then we also want, want clarif clarif further clarification on, on pilot program aside in an area where I believe that meter fees are also should be done by ordinance. Yeah. Um, and currently it's sort of done by pilot in response to, you know, initiatives and whatever. But I think that that should be codified. Um, just my working knowledge of, of the building. Um, and so if we can get some further clarification as to in instances where we were going to, um, I guess, jack up meter fees, I would argue that that has to come through the council similar to how you're before the council now. So it's with the exception of obviously pilot programs, we do the pilot program, we get a sample, kind of test the waters a little bit, and then when we decide that we want to either make that pilot permanent or we want to expand, in all other instances, whether it's sandwich boards, pilot programs that Council O'Malley, Council Siomo, all of us have been part of. When those pilot programs become permanent, they then come back through the council um, and have them sort of made permanent and codified. So I just want to make sure that we're not sidestepping the legislative branch of city government when it comes to fees and fines, particularly uh, we're having a discussion on meter fees. So yes. We've also been joined by my colleague, City Council Michelle Wu. Good morning, Council Wu. Any questions at this time? So I'm sorry if this is um, doubling back. I really just had one. Uh, I guess overall, I think this is great. I think it's about aligning incentives for people who are parking their cars. You know, when it's cheaper to just take the ticket versus go find a, a garage, that you know we're going to see this happen. Um, but what happens if the projections don't? Or the what happens if the actual revenues from people receiving the fines don't hit five million? Um, in terms of what we're trying, what you all are trying to do on the programmatic side, where, where will the funding come from? Yeah. Uh, the ultimate answer to that, the specific question is actually sort of best handled by our budget office, but the, uh, the expectation is this will raise $5 million, but the approval of the mayor's proposed operating capital budget is, uh, while it essentially relies on this revenue investment, this revenue is not tied to those specific capital and operating investments. So it, those, would, those would proceed uh, as well, and they're not tied to the revenue that will come specifically. Okay, this. great. And I guess a, a sort of corollary question is, 
would you expect, just based on analysis of parking behavior, that the first year's kind of revenues would be higher as people realize that this is actually happening, and then it goes down from there? Or how are you thinking about year two, three, four? Yeah, um, and so there's not a lot of fantastic research about uh, that sort of looks at longitudinal trends. Um, but what we have basically pegged this to is some research that has shown uh, when you do increase fines, what is the relative behavior change? So we think we've taken a, a, a fairly sort of conservative tack based on sort of on research, and it does not seem like there is increasing behavior change after subsequent years, and you capture most of that behavior change sort of in the first year, and that it endures, but it doesn't continue to decline. Okay. And in terms of the level of the fines, yep. um, is it is this the maximum for each of these sections, or what, or how did you kind of arrive at the specific number? Uh, we were really looking at both sort of a peer city comparison where some of uh, other cities that are in this space and also trying to respond to the volume of, of uh, complaints that we were getting from constituents and to your earlier point around some things like meter fees, looking at the fact that there are some locations in our city where potentially the financially rational decision is to uh, not pay the meter, park at the curb, get the ticket, rather than to pay uh, for a parking garage. Okay. Do you have baselines now of how, like for example, how many violations, not by a revenue amount, but how many yep. are happening each year yes. mm -hmm. of, of all these? So we'll be able to compare. Exactly. Okay, great. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, um, Council Wu. So we're, uh, this is the period where we uh, shift to public testimony. So we're waiting for the sheet. If there's anyone wishing to offer public testimony, may do so now or forever hold your peace. And you do so by coming down to um, the uh, microphone to the left, <coughs> if you will, and just ask that you state your name and affiliation for the record, and, uh, and you have the floor. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Andrew McFarland. Morning, I'm the Andrew. Community Engagement Manager for Livable Streets Alliance. Um, I want to thank the Government Operations Committee for holding this hearing, and um, just say that Livable Streets is very supportive of the proposed fines increase. And um, we just want to kind of center on like what the benefits are for this um, this proposal. Um, we're really excited that this will help advance Go Boston 2030 and all the benefits it'll have for walking, uh, biking, uh, taking transit, and better using our roads for cars. Um, you know, Go Boston was a really an outpouring of huge public engagement with uh, people across the city. So helping further that um, is really in the interest of the city. We think. Um, I just want to focus on one specific aspect of um, where this money will go is the proposed transit team. Um, we can't really stress how important that is that the city will have um, staffing and resources dedicated to um, fixing our bus system. Um, this has been a big uh, initiative of livable streets over the last few years. Um, we've been advocating for such staffing, um, you know, not only because it's best practice, but a lot of other cities are doing this now, and this will help us better use our street space um, to move buses more efficiently. Um, the MBTA system services over 450,000 people a day, and most of those people are traveling um, in city limits. Um, and we found through our own analysis that about seven miles of um, chronically congested Boston streets are holding back about one-fifth of um, bus passengers. And one mile where that's especially true is in Rosendale, where the city has been leading um, a really awesome pilot um, the last four weeks. Uh, this morning was the last um, you know, iteration of the pilot, but we're hopefully uh, going to see more of it in the uh, weeks to come. Um, but that pilot has been successful because the city has let, uh, let it themselves. Um, and I think that that's a really important lesson and why we really need this transit team. We understand our streets, we understand our neighborhoods, we can best lead uh, these improvements in transit, um, and the city should take the initiative in doing that. Um, and I think that these fines and um, fees and increases are you know, all the more reason why we need more substantial parking reform. Um, you know, I couldn't agree more with Councilor Flaherty's points about expanding the times when we're having um, metered um, fees in, in action um, for, for parking meters. Um, and we should also be thinking about where are we going to be expanding uh, meters to other parts of the city. Um, Livable Streets has circulated a parking memo with um, the council and has some ideas for ways that we can tackle 
um, parking reform. You know, I think it requires a carrot and a stick approach. You know, the, the fines increase is a bit of a stick, but we need to figure out some more carrots to incentivize uh, better use of our curbside space. Um, so we just want to encourage the council to also lead that discussion. We know that there's some um, some action on that front, but um, really having progressive conversations about what does it mean to better uh, manage our curbside is really crucial at this moment. So I um, just want to thank the council for their attention on this matter and um, urge you to um, pass the mayor's proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning, sir. If you could state your name and affiliation. For Good morning. That. My name is Brennan Carney. I'm the communications right. director for Walk Boston. Welcome. Walk Boston has supported the efforts of BTD's Go Boston 2030 and the public engagement process around that. We're very glad the mayor's budget has the updated fine schedules and being put into place to help make this plan a reality. Um, Boston's seeing a development boom that includes many of the transportation action plan agreements that are supposed to yield private investment in improving both public and private streetscapes, adding a transportation planner to track and manage these improvements. Uh, are very important so they directly benefit the surrounding neighborhoods and also can work with locally privately funded transportation associations like Seaport TMA and the ABC TMA to increase the share of people walking, biking, and taking transit. That's a really good idea. Um, and this money you know, will be felt in the ground in the neighborhoods with improvements, better signals, neighborhood slow streets, corridor improvements. And I just wanted to highlight one example from this week of why it's important to have people that are managing different departments. Um, you know, the coordination is important because just this week we were at a meeting where um, Transportation Department was talking about improvements to Walnut Ave in Roxbury, and they're kind of taking advantage of Public Works already had a, uh, they were doing sidewalk repairs in the area, and they were about to put out a RFP to do those improvements. Since transportation and public works are now working much closely together, they were identifying other changes that can be made on Walnut Ave to make it safer to get to the Ellis School and in and around the area. So they're layering these contracts to make an even bigger impact in the area instead of just doing one-off repairs on this street and then thinking longer term about Walnut Ave. So this coordination, like there will be other ways to coordinate this here with this new budget too. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Brennan. And uh, Pam, is uh, you have signed to testify. So welcome. And if you can state your name and affiliation for the record, you have the floor. Yes. Again. Good morning, Chairman Flaherty and members of the committee. My name is Pam Coker. I am the Vice President of the Boston Municipal Research Bureau. I am also a city resident. The Research Bureau supports the parking-related fi parking fines recommended in docket number 0566 for several reasons. First of all, the Research Bureau has a long-standing position that the City of Boston should periodically increase the fees and fines so as to not lose ground in keeping fee and fine revenues close to the expense of providing related services, in this case, transportation services. As already noted, these parking fines were last saw a comprehensive evaluation and increase around 2008. Secondly, it has become even more important for the city to look at other ways to increase its own source revenue because the city's heavy reliance on the property tax and the limited growth in state aid, the city's second largest revenue source, the mayor's recommended fiscal 2019 budget relies on the property tax for 70% of total operating revenue. And that is not atypical for a city's budget. My third point is that the pro proposed parking fine increases are estimated to raise, as already noted, the $5 million in additional operating revenue to improve transportation services in the city. Transportation service is clearly a very important matter for both the business community and Boston residents, so those who live and or work in the city are able to move easily throughout the city. A uh, few highlights um, of key transportation investments which we want to make particular note of um, include the emphasis on improving MBTA bus service working with the city, um, particularly given that residents and workers do rely on MBTA, MBTA bus service more than any other mode of transportation. Um, we appreciate the city's uh, focus on a transit team, including a liaison to the MBTA, which we agree should help move, help move and improve that service of busing. 
the use of the dedicated bus lane on Washington Street in Roslindale um, could lead to further expansion of this program to speed up bus service in the city. Um, and I understand folks have been quite pleased with that for the most part. Um, in addition, improvements in bicycle and walking routes will make alternate transportation choices more attractive for those who live and work in the city. So more than three million of the $5 million fine increase will be dedicated to capital expenses related to specifically road resurfacing and sidewalk reconstruction that otherwise would likely not be able to recur. So for these reasons, the Research Bureau strongly recommends that the City Council approve docket number 0566 as recommended. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pam. Anyone else wishing to offer public testimony may do so now. Uh, forever hold you, please. That will conclude the public testimony piece. My colleagues, uh, by way of parting comments, anyone have any other thoughts? No, Councilor O'Malley? Councilor Council Wu has a follow-up? This is just came out of the testimony. Any any special announcement related to the dedicated bus lane pilot or anything? Uh, not at this point. Yeah. No, so it's like it breaks it down simple when they confirmed it. So thank you. Uh, any anything else from Councilor Sabi George? So thank you, Chief and Commissioner and um, Steve and Vinit. I appreciate your time and attention to this matter. Um, so in a very short period of time, I guess which yeah. today Friday, we'll so maybe, maybe Monday Tuesday, Tuesday at the latest, because yeah. we'll. We'll have week. to take this up uh, in short order and then um, yep. and then uh, take a look at neighborhood by neighborhood breakdown of this and then again see where if something could be tweaked uh, to make up for the differential maybe on, on, on the parking meter one but um, so that we can have a, a number that's satisfactory to what you guys need to do to carry out your mission and what folks uh, here in the council as well as the public want uh, for uh, necessary changes. So with respect to... Um, Docket um, 06, where's my card here? 0655, right? 066. 0566, you got it, yeah. With respect to uh, docket 0566, uh, the Committee on Government Operations with, with, with respect to amending City of Boston Code Ordinances Chapter 6, Section 6-63, Schedule of Parking Fees will be adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>